All right, guys, Murph's here. And today we're going to continue a kind of mini series that I've been doing on the channel discussing obscure shotgun shell cartridges. Now, already previously, I've done several families of cartridge discussions. I've discussed the 38 family as well as the 22 rimfire family. And those I find very interesting because as you go through those cartridges, you really traverse a lot of the development of the self-contained cartridge history and all that kind of stuff. I decided in this case I would go after the entire variety of obscure shotgun shells that have existed over the years. However, it wound up being a lot. There are a lot of really weird shotgun designations and cartridges and stuff like that that are out there. So I decided to break it up into a more bite-sized type setup. So previously, uh, kind of the first part of the shotgun portion of this was done on everything greater than like 12 gauge. And now we're going to talk about the stuff between 12 and the 20 gauge. Now, one of the important things to identify right off the bat is that how gauges work is the smaller the number, the wider the overall item. And there's a lot that goes into how a shotgun is designated by gauge and all that kind of stuff. That's already been covered in a shotgun termin or a shotgun shell terminology video previously done on the channel. Link in the description. So if you're looking for that type of stuff to get a better understanding of how all of these terms and stuff like that work, go ahead and check out that video. All right, so today we're going to start off with the 14 gauge. Now the 14 gauge is really interesting because it seems like there was some following in the United States for the 14 gauge at one point, but it pretty much fizzled out at like the beginning of the 20th century. It seems like the 14 gauge held on in Europe for a little bit longer, as in you can still buy 14 gauge shotgun holes in France, but as far as I know, nobody's loading up a modern 14 gauge shotgun shell. Now these would be made in two, two and a half and two and nine sixteenths length shotgun shields, if I remember correctly. If I got that wrong, I'll annotate it down below. Now, the only real notable thing with the 14 gauge shotgun shell is that in the 1950s, Winchester was experimenting with a aluminum hold 14 gauge for a semi-automatic shotgun that they were working on at the time. Now, the owner of Winchester at that time had like a lot of his diversification of his business into aluminum. So he was looking to capitalize on that and also develop like an aluminum 20 gauge shotgun shell and all that kind of stuff. However, none of that took off. And the only place you'll find those shotgun shells now are in the collections of cartridge collectors. Just like you'll still run across, like I remember seeing here recently a case of 14, like 114 gauge shotgun shells, paper hold 14 gauge shotgun shells. That ammunition's just collector grade at this point. It is not something that's supposed to be fired through anything that exists. Now from there, we get into the 15 gauge. What is a 15 gauge? There's actually quite a bit of debate over what an actual 15 gauge is. Because keep in mind, there's not a lot of 15, gauge run 15 gauges running around. 15 gauge shotguns were custom options. And a lot of what you'll find in the 15 gauge is a pin fire. Now, Murph, what is a pin fire? A pin fire is a very early form of self-contained cartridge casing. So it's a brass cartridge casing that has all of its primer compound placed in the rim, and there's a pin that protrudes from it. And this pin would be impacted by the hammer of the gun, which would drive it into the primer compound, set off the primer compound, <clears throat> send the bolt down range. And Pin fires were not just done in shotgun shells. They were done in handgun cartridges as well as rifle cartridges. Now, obviously, once the center-primed cartridge casing came along, the pin fire went away pretty quickly because there are some disadvantages to pin fires, pretty significant ones at that. But at one time, this was pretty decent technology, especially when you're coming off of like muzzle loaders or something along those lines. Now, there's some d discussion that custom shotgun manufacturers at the time were actually just using 16-gauge shotgun shells. I mean, pin-fired 16-gauge shotgun shells, but referring to them as 15-gauge in order to make sure that their customers would come back to them for the ammunition. There's a lot of <clears throat> examples throughout history of custom manufacturers doing stuff like that. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility. It's just very difficult to confirm. Now, from the 15 gauge, we would go into the 16 gauge, except I've already done a whole video covering the 16 gauge, which if you're interested in that, link in the description. 16 gauge is one of my favorite cartridges, and I have a ton of 16 gauge shotguns, like a surprising number. 
From there, we go into the 64 Maynard. Now, what is a 64 Maynard? It sounds like something produced by Chevy in 1964. Like, I'm expecting, you know, like a really long, wide body with, you know, kind of like flared taillights and stuff like that. Murph, what is a 64 Maynard? Well, this was a shotgun shell, a brass case shotgun shell that was developed for the Maynard rifle. Now, those of you who don't know, the Maynard rifle was a cavalry carbine utilized during the American Civil War. And this was one of many varieties of cavalry carbines utilized by both sides during the American Civil War. One of the interesting things about how that, sh that single shot breech loading rifle is set up is that you can swap out the barrels to other cartridges, in this case, a, a shotgun shell. This was meant to be paired, the 64 Maynard specifically, was meant to be paired with the 4040 Maynard, which being a black powder cartridge, we can guesstimate that that is a 40 caliber projectile sitting on 40 grains of black powder. So you can swap out the barrel real quick and plug in a 64 Maynard shotgun shell. All right, that's the 64 Maynard. What is an 18 gauge, Murph? Well, this is interesting. There's not a whole lot of information out there about this, the 18 gauge other than it was produced in the United States. It had a following here. It would be produced in a... Hold on, let me check my notes here real quick for the shotgun shell length. Uh, this information coming out, uh, some of this information at least, coming out of my Cartridges of the World 11th Edition book. There we go. Okay. So it was produced in both a 1 and 7 eighths and a 2 and 9 16 inch shotgun shell. And it's right there in between the 16 gauge and the 20 gauge. First off, those are very short shells especially when you're talking about some this kind of older technology because the 18 gauge reaches back to the point of also having been produced as a pin fire. So we're probably talking about when this shotgun shell was at its most popular, most popular being a black powder loading and all that kind of stuff. And at that short of a shell with relatively anemic velocities associated with black powder, you were probably not getting a lot of performance out of that shotgun shell. And it's very interesting in general whenever it is that you talk about shotgun shells because look at we have we have so many offerings out there. We have like everything, every designation, every possible bore diameter eventually being loaded into a shotgun shell as we'll sue and uncover. What causes one to thrive and another to fizzle out? And I think a lot of it comes down to marketing. Whatever writer endorsed the 20 gauge, whatever competition circuit was allowing the use of the 12 gauge and all that other kind of stuff, and maybe not necessarily endorsing the 18 gauge or the 14 gauge or so on and so forth. And those cartridges that were getting endorsed or were getting used in competition circuits were the things that were getting more and more load options available, more and more cartridge lengths and all that kind of stuff. And when you have that type of innovation going into a cartridge, that's what's going to set it apart from everything else in the competition. So I think the 18 gauge might have just been a victim of the times, as far as I can tell. Because this is also a cartridge that would have been trying to pull itself out of the primordial ooze, just like the 14 gauge, just like the 15 gauge, or any of the other shotgun shells we've discussed thus far. What caused the 10 gauge to flourish and the 8 gauge to die? What propelled the 12 gauge into the spotlight but neutered the 14 gauge? It's really impossible to tell other than just what managed to catch on. It could even be wild rumors that did in one and, pro and propel the other forward. You know? Oh, well, you know, the 12 gauge just, it, it shoots harder when in all reality, and you'll sometimes hear this type of thing discussed in shotguns. Oh, well, this uh, this shotgun in this gauge shoots harder, therefore it's more powerful. And really, it just means that, like, you have a super janky stock. Maybe it's at a really bad angle, or maybe it's really thin, and it's just kicking your shoulder really hard because, like, energy and, you know, physics and all that kind of stuff. And you're, you've decided that because you're getting kicked in the shoulder so hard, then clearly that means that this gun's really powerful, which really just means that perhaps the buttstock's poorly designed or... Perhaps the gun is too light for what it is that you're trying to do. The power is not dictated by the recoil in this case. Comfort's dictated by the recoil in that case. So it could very simply be something along those lines that kind of set the 18 gauge aside because somebody else decided that the 16 gauge was more powerful, which in all honesty, they wouldn't be wrong. But 
you kind of get the same conversation whenever it is that we discuss like pistol cartridges. You know, uh, the common trend now, or the common talking point in nine millimeter is that with the current investment in metallurgy and all that kind of stuff and bullet design that nine millimeter has become viable because it's achieving the penetration and the expansion and stuff like the optimal penetration and expansion that it's supposed to, which is why the FBI has gone back to it. And you have guys who are against the nine millimeter who are like, well, you know, 40 and 45 would be getting the advantages of that same like metallurgy and technology and all that kind of stuff. So like, you know, nine millimeter still would be, you should go with a 40 or 45 because more powerful, bigger numbers, duh. When there's so much more that goes in that conversation than just the numbers, than just the, the penetration, even just the penetration and all that kind of stuff. Number of rounds carried, size of the grip, size of the gun, weight of the gun, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Then the, it's, it is lip service to boil down complicated arguments to just a singular point of information. Like that's dumb. That is completely bereft of any type of logic. And unfortunately, especially when you talk about like times predating the digital age where information was far more accessible, where ideas were far more accessible and more easily disproven or proven one way or the other, you could easily run into a situation where, you know, you have a whole bunch of like gun shop or gun show, or gun show lore where, you know, somebody comes along and is like, ah, oh, well, you know, as I heard in a gun shop this weekend, you know, 22 LR has uh, more energy than a 380. And like, I'm sitting in the background, like, that doesn't math. That's like, that's not mathematically possible for a 22 LR to be able to have more energy than a 380. Like, it's just that that doesn't work that way. It's not it's not how that works. And it also skips over like a whole bunch of other aspects of the overall discussion, which we've talked about in the 22 LR video. Link in the description if you're interested in that. But like, people have a tendency, especially whenever it is that you're talking about small groups, small circuits of information and stuff like that, not necessarily having access to critical information that might change the opinion one way or another. That's how cartridges like the 18 gauge go to the wayside. Now that was like a really roundabout way to get back to the point of, I can think of no discernible reason why the 18 gauge didn't catch on. All history can really show us is that it didn't. And the end state was that the 20 gauge and the 16 gauge surged forward, surged forward and the 18 gauge fell to the wayside. All right, guys, good short video for you this week. I hope you guys found this interesting and that's pretty much what I got. Have a good day.